I'm Rene Ritchie, welcome back. On today's show, I'm gonna dive into how Apple became a silicon powerhouse. Let's hit it. Once upon a time, Apple was making a phone and needed a chipset, so it took one from a Samsung set-top box. It worked, but it became clear if Apple wanted to differentiate its phones, it would have to differentiate what powered them. There's this old story about Steve Jobs wanting sushi at Cafe Max, the campus eatery, so he got the best sushi chef he could find to make it for him. Likewise, chipsets. When it became clear iPhone and future products would require custom silicon, the story goes Steve Jobs set out to find the best chip designers in the world to make that happen. If we time slide or use the Wayback Machine or whatever, it's worth mentioning that Apple was an original founder of Advanced Risk Machine, which became ARM and was used in the original new PDAs. But after the Newton was deleted by Steve Jobs, Apple's interest in ARM seemed to go away. Then, on April 23, 2008, months before the introduction of iPhone 3G, Apple bought PA Semi. Fabless, meaning it designed its own chips but didn't fabricate it themselves, PA Semi was founded in Santa Clara, California in 2003, and it had a lot of the kind of talent Apple was looking for. So in April of 2010, when Apple upended the tablet market by announcing the iPad, virtually unrealized at the time, it also upended Mobile Silicon by announcing its first in-house ARM licensed chipset. That same month, Apple bought Intrinsity, an Austin, Texas-based Fabless semiconductor. That's when it started to become clear beyond just the silicon nerds that Apple was taking this very seriously, and it was literally hiring some of the best CPU and GPU minds available. In 2012, Apple shifted from licensing the ARM design to licensing the ARM instruction set, and that made A6 the first Apple designed system on a chip, or SOC. In 2013, the Apple A7 was the first 64-bit mobile processor. Again, almost no one expected this, least of all from Apple. It caught everyone from Qualcomm to Samsung, not just flat-footed, but flabbergasted, and in many ways they spent the last several years struggling to catch up. In 2016, Apple A10 Fusion still mopped the floor with both the Samsung Exynos and Qualcomm Snapdragon lines found in the Galaxy S8 when it came to single-threaded operations. Both Samsung and Qualcomm's chipsets did perform faster than Apple's A10 Fusion for multi-core operations, but there are four high-performance and four high-efficiency cores in the S8 to the two high-performance and two high-efficiency cores in the iPhone 7. It literally took twice the cores to edge ahead in the results. Hi, <laughs> meet Amdahl's law. And it turned out their efficiency cores weren't anywhere nearly as efficient as Apple's. So let's break that down. If you have four people in the family, but only one of you has a driver's license, sure, you can get through household chores in a quarter of the time, but anything that requires a car, not so much. The same is true for processors. If half the tasks are serial and half are parallel, a processor could have an infinite amount of cores at its disposal, but all of those cores crushing their half won't help one bit with the other half. That's what makes cores so misleading. Like comparing a Lamborghini to a Mack truck, more cores, like more tires, are good for some things, but not everything. Apple had obviously seen the value in over-delivering on single-threaded operations, and it showed. For things like interface and interactions, that was often the bottleneck. No matter how fast modern chipsets could swap, if the experience felt slow, then the phone felt slow. In other words, it's really no mystery why iPhone scrolls better and feels more responsive than anything else on the market. Monstrous single-threaded processing enables it. And yeah, that focus hasn't been without its own risks and problems. Just look at what happened with throttling, primarily in the iPhone 6 and 6S. But overall, with the fixes in place now, it's been a huge success. In 2017, Apple A11 Bionic made the efficiency cores almost as fast as previous generation performance cores, decoupled them so all the cores could be used at once and revealed the company had spent three years integrating a neural engine block, artificial intelligence, at the silicon level. Part of the reason Apple can move so fast, no pun intended, is that it doesn't sell its chipsets, so it doesn't have to operate like a silicon merchant. It doesn't have to worry about the shelf life of each generation. It doesn't have to concern itself with the demands of marketing, markup, or the interest of multiple competing vendors. Apple's platform technologies team doesn't have to worry about being hobbled or constrained in any way. Literally, all they have to do is run I iOS and iOS apps faster than anything else on the planet. Apple is their only customer. It makes for an incredibly appealing work environment for legends of the industry and the best and brightest new minds, a startling number of whom have now found a home at Apple. It's a dream job that doesn't just let them dream, but it actively encourages them to make those dreams into a reality. We first saw what kinds of results the team could produce with the Apple A7. Rumors of it being 64-bit had run rampant, yet few in the industry saw the full scope or believed them at the time. Competitors have been tend to languish at 32-bit with little or no impetus to push forward. Then iPhone 5S was announced, and instantly, 
everything changed. Apple immediately leapfrogged everyone else in the industry and in the span of a few minutes became not just its leader, but its driving force. That might sound hyperbolic, but in hindsight, it is absolutely provably true. It's a fact. But it's been really hard to see. Many of us, myself included, struggle to understand why. Most of us fell victim to the old cliche of more bits only being useful to address larger amounts of memory, which didn't seem important at all on mobile. A few of us settled onto the cleaner instruction set or improved hardware security as the rationale behind the change. But what Apple really did with the A7 was completely re-architect the chipset itself. That was a leap forward. 64-bit was just the gateway. Given infinite time, any good silicon team could design a system on a chip that would achieve maximum performance at maximum efficiency up to the limits of known physics in our universe. Release schedules are the opposite of infinite time though. You get a few years to plan, but you have to ship every single year. What Apple's done to meet that demand is to establish a solid foundation and to build and iterate on it each and every year. It's not just a multi-year plan, it's a multi-year investment. Apple has long believed that tightly integrating both software and hardware allows the company to deliver a better experience to customers. These days, that's expanded to include services on one end and chipsets on the other. It means the platform technologies team can work with the software engineering group and industrial and human interface design groups to make exact exactly the atoms to support exactly the bits and pixels that Apple plans to ship. Silicon has to work years ahead, of course, which means there's a predictive element to it, not unlike shooting an arrow at another arrow that needs to not only hit it in midair, but ensure both continue on to the bullseye. But the result is when new features like the camera team's depth of field effect for portrait mode, the image signal processor team has built in everything they need to support it. That's why, for example, Apple's portrait mode worked in live view first generation and Google's couldn't even two generations in. And if you don't think that matters, then you just don't take photographs the way they're meant to be taken. Conversely, Apple Silicon team also doesn't have to carry the baggage of competing vendors and devices. For example, Apple A10 didn't have to support Microsoft's DirectX. It only had to and exactly support Apple's specific technologies and implementations, then OpenGL, now Metal. In other words, what iOS wants fast, the A-Team can deliver fast. And that's important because you never want to ship chipsets. You want to ship feature sets. Apple never shipped NFC. It shipped Apple Pay. It's the same reason specs and benchmarks don't matter at all compared to user experience. It's still the chipsets that enable features and ensure that experience, but it's those features and experiences that have to deliver. One of the most fascinating aspects of all the attention being paid to iPhone performance in benchmarks relative to, say, for example, the Samsung Galaxy line is that it's incidental, a circumstance of design and singular philosophy. For A10 Fusion, pushing maximum performance on bigger cores meant leaving a gap on the low end, pairing the high performance cores with high efficiency cores, and creating a performance controller to intelligently manage the switching all but invisibly eliminated that gap. That controller gave Apple not only the best of both processing worlds, but a significant advantage over chipsets lacking those smarts. That carried over to the A11. For the graphics cores, Apple has long used a different wide and slow approach. And with A11, the company has gone all in with its first fully custom GPU. It can handle loads as efficiently as possible, but it also gives them the headroom to handle spikes when they need to. In other words, performance and power efficiency go hand in hand. They can't be viewed separately. In fact, when done right, high efficiency enables high performance. What's become increasingly fascinating of late isn't just Apple's A-series SOCs. It's the company's CPU and GPU inside them. It's the now integrated M-series sensor Fusion Hub. It's the image signal processor and the video encode decode blocks. It's the controllers that let flash storage on an iPhone be accessed as fast as it is on a MacBook Pro. In 2016, we saw Apple embed a variant of the Apple Watch's S1 system in package into the MacBook Pro as the T1 to handle Touch ID, Apple Pay, and other security systems. T2 in the iMac Pro and the 2018 MacBook Pro handles secure booting and replaces what used to be a bunch of disparate controllers. W1 made Bluetooth all but painless on the AirPods and beats wireless headphones, and W2 has made Apple Watch 3 far less dependent on iPhone for connectivity. It's not that Apple wants to make every component inside every device, but it feels very much like Apple wants to own every component that makes a real palpable, differentiated experience for customers. When Apple introduced W1, I joked that there were still 20 odd more letters in the alphabet for future Apple Silicon, but the results we see today shows that that's not a joke. In a world where Qualcomm is more concerned with making great silicon than holding the rest of the industry ransom to its patent portfolio, where Samsung deploys custom chips up and down its line, where Nvidia ships monster mobile CPU and GPU all its own, 
Everyone benefits, customers most of all. Until that happens, Apple's singular drive to make the best chipsets, to treat performance and power efficiency as one and the same, and to design silicon that specifically supports software and services will continue to provide them a commanding lead. But it'll also motivate everyone in the industry to keep catching up. About the only thing that could possibly conceivably be better are custom vector t-shirts, all of your own. I know you saw what I saw, what you did when I did there, but I wanna tell you about them because they are awesome. They are brand new. If you're watching this video now, they are available for pre-order. If you're watching it later, you might be able to pick one up immediately. I can't tell you how thrilled I am with how they came out, with how the design looks, with how the t-shirts look. It's the beautiful vector orange with this smoky gray charcoal background, and it, it just pops. So if you wanna support the show, if you want a vector t-shirt of your very own, if you just wanna be the best looking person in your social circles, then just head over to standard.tv vector and get yours now. Thank you so much. So again, I know a bunch of people are already rage typing into their keyboards that this just sounded like a puff piece or an employment video or something for Apple Silicon, but I think fair is fair here. If any other company in the world were doing with Silicon what Apple is doing with it, I would be clamoring for Apple to catch up. But I wanna know what you think. Hit like, hit subscribe, and then let me know in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching.